All right, so we're going to start over this. And what I was telling y'all in the chat a minute ago that we wanted to, um, I wanted to be more interactive. Um, is that we can start seeing if I need to show y'all if y'all want to pipe in. I, I would like for us to, you know, maybe once or twice a month kind of do a virtual so we can all see each other, check in on each other. If you can't do that, that's fine. Just let us know and we'll talk. Um, I'm going to be doing that all night, fussing up my daughter, so I apologize. Um, but our big thing is, is just so y'all have more interaction. Uh, we show more visual aids, kind of go over a few things like that. So we're going to go over the top three chapters that we hit last couple of nights. Um, so we're going to read through this. I'll read over it. We're going to go over a few more things. I'm going to ask y'all some questions. So that's where I want y'all to kind of get some feedback. All right. So I'm having to move screens around because I'm not at work and I don't have the multiple three screens anymore. So, all right. So you're dispatched to a um, unresponsive man. A, a citizen bystander reports that a man is acting strangely. The police are already on scene. You consider the location of the patient and realize a homeless camp that has been that has had a recent outbreak of TB and is not too far away. With this in mind, you put some gloves on and a HEPA mask. What's some other things that we're going to be building in our brains as we're getting ready to go to these calls? Anybody? Hello. Sorry, I have to push the chat button. I realize that. All right, to get a mask for the patient too. That's a good one. Um, also, depends on what time of day it is. Uh, if we want, make sure we got extra light. If we're going in that area, uh, you feel uncomfortable, feel unsafe. You also want to have a PD roll with you. Uh, if fire is an option, at least have more manpower there to kind of help you out. Or if you need to request an additional unit. Whoops. There we go. All right. Why is the patient assessment considered one of the cornerstones for pre-hospital care? Uh, so tell me why why is patient assessment the most important for for our care as we get ready to go? What, what's so big about the patient assessment? down on time for the emergency room. I guess. Correct. Uh, Mac, and that's a good point. You, you're building your history. You're kind of given the hospital that didn't see the scene, uh, that they don't know what's going on. You get the ability to give them, you paint them a picture and what the patient answered at, this, at the time. Uh, Travis, to get a plan and action to care together. So you don't know this person. You're building a uh, screenshots in your head of what this person say in our history to kind of work for your treatment of care just like you're saying Travis it's just a plan of action uh so you can go from there I don't know why it's not changing all right on arrival see an unresponsive man, or unresponsive man lying down on the side of the road a police officer standing near the patient he reports that a utility worker saw the man stumbling along sit down and pass out as you approach the patient, you notice a devilish-looking man, or the approximately who is approximately 40, 40 years old. So then the next part, you see an old shopping cart filled with junk is nearby. The patient does not make any attempt to move and is uh, making any sounds other than some snoring. Uh, he is, has he does have a radio pulse, so there is no obvious bleeding or signs of trauma. You decide to load the patient in the ambulance and continue your assessment on the road. So, why wouldn't you stay and play in that situation? Anybody have an idea? Could be a traffic hazard. Correct. Just like we said a second ago. Yep. It could be safety. Um, uh, obviously, PD's there because PD's the one that was told you the guy was standing there, kind of gave you a little history. Um, what's some of the things off of what we just put right here? What's some of the things that we're automatically building in our brain of kind of a preliminary history? What are we, what do you want to go with? Sounds like he's homeless. Homeless. Uh, could, he, could be malnutritious. Uh, could be an alcohol. 
could be diabetic, um, could be drugs. So all those things are starting to build in your mind just by this part right here. It says you're stumbling, sat down, and passed out. That's where I'm going to go. Um, you, I'm going to say at 40-year-old, that's probably a healthy individual because that's my age. So I'm pretty sure that's what I'm going with. But probably, you know, he's probably not the best of health care. He doesn't have follow up with a primary doctor or anything like that. Doesn't take any medications, I'm sure, because he just there's no way for him to pay for them. Um, so here, I have to move my little box over so it takes me a second to read this for you guys. All right. So what information can be obtained by a quick survey of the scene before getting uh, greeting your patient? What's your scene survey? What are you looking for? Uh, off of what we read, what's what are you picking up? I mean, like surrounding. Yep. Let's go with what you see. Uh, we kind of talked about it right here for just a second. Um, he's got a shopping cart with junk. And what we call junk may be everything that he owns. Um, and then you see that we talked about there's a homeless camp nearby. So you're building your assessment. You've probably been there a lot um, for one or two calls. Yeah. Uh, what are you saying? Ask bystanders. They may know, know him more than anyone else. Correct. NPD may know him way more than you. Let's say if it's a Unfortunately, a drug overdose or an alcohol the person's an alcoholic PD probably going to know him. They probably may know him by first name. Okay. Um, Travis, you're saying it's the uh, the environment, the condition of the patient, right? I'm pretty sure from what we're reading is he's not going to be a three piece suit and tie. He's going to be in whatever he owns, and that's probably all he owns. And unfortunately, he probably does have an odor to him. Uh, we don't want to cause any issues with him and. You know, kind of our face is going to be like, well, you need to take a bath, but we can't do that. We got we got to continue to keep up the uh, professionalism. Um, can you identify life threatening problems by simply asking the patient what happened? What's what's the first things that you want to assess that will give you if there's any type of trauma or life threatening? <laughs> Uh, correct. See if he is responsive. Typed it in the group. You're going to check for ABCs. As you're walking up, you can be like, hey, sir, can you hear me? Yes, sir. sir, can you hear me? Sir. Then at the same time, Matt, like you said, you're checking the responsiveness. If he rolls, moans, groans, or whatever else, you're, you're checking those boxes simultaneously. Does that make sense? So we're starting to identify those initially. You're looking for uh, fluid laying on the ground, and fluid may be considered blood or bodily fluids or something to that nature. You know, all the good stuff happens out there when we're taking care of these patients. All right, so after evaluating and treating the patient for respiratory difficulty, which improved after placing them on a nasopharyngeal airway and provided oxygen, the patient is lifted onto the stretcher using its extremity lift and packaged for transport to the local hospital. In route, you complete your primary assessment, looking for an explanation as to the man's unresponsiveness state and find nothing to explain the situation besides he smells of alcohol. Well, like I said, I, I literally looked at these slides probably 30 minutes before we started, and I really didn't even see this one down here that says alcohol. So automatically, I was building in my head that it's either alcohol or drug. Now... I don't want to say that's profiling by no means, but that's 20 years of being on the streets that you kind of see a pattern of things. And a lot of times alcohol is cheap for those guys and a lot of your homeless resort into alcohol. Um, so drug use is kind of high for them. It's hard for them to find the con consistency of money. So they all kind of resort to the alcohol. So if he smells of alcohol, unfortunately, you're probably going to also have the smell of urination. So be careful for that. Even when you go to put him on your stretcher, you may just want to, you know, protect your stuff as and put a sheet down on the stretcher prior to laying the patient. You know, if it's in the weather that we have right now, we can just say, sir, look, we want to cover you up and give you some type of blanket. Not to make them feel bad that they're 
leaking urine all over our stretcher. But at the same point, we're trying to keep him covered and keep his bodily fluids within himself. Um, so part three, set, uh, set of vital signs reveals a blood pressure of 142 over 96. Can somebody tell me what the MMHG stands for? Millimeters of mercury. Correct. MMHG is millimeters of mercury. Good job. All right. So it's 142 over 96 and a supine position. A weak radial pulse of 88 and a shallow labored respiration to 24. His skin is pink, warm, and dry. History has been difficult to obtain because he's unresponsive. However, a prescription of rampant was written by a homeless clinic and was found in the patient's pocket. So with just your respiration, I mean, I'm sorry, just your set of vitals, is that telling you anything right out the gate? Does anybody pick up anything that's telling you here? Shallow labor breathing? Correct. Uh, I'm trying to get my mouth to... Travis says respiration is too y'all. Mac, you and Travis are on the same point. So what if he's laying flat, the body's not having to pump hard to get the blood per to get the blood to and from his lower extremities already. It's flat. But look at this top number. So he probably, you know, he probably has does have a history of non-treated hypertension. So think that in the back of your mind. And then you can ask him later on. Be like, if you get this guy to come around, be like, hey man, you got high blood? Do you happen to have any medications that you're not taking or you haven't ever had to get filled? And if he says that, because of that number right there and in what position he's in, should tell you a lot of things, too. I mean, it, it could help you build up your case is what I'm going to lean towards. All right. Part three. How does the patient's chief complaint guide you in your assessment? Well, so here's my question. What is the chief complaint? He's not feeling well. Okay. Okay. Well, the call initially came in from a bystander that saw him sit down, fall over, and pass out. So I jokingly say, well, he doesn't have a chief complaint, but for safety and security reasons why they can't leave him sitting on the curb because he's too close to the road. Like y'all said earlier, it could be a, a, uh, a traffic hazard. So he's got to go somewhere. Unfortunately, that's our fault. We got to be able to take him somewhere. So, would you consider this patient a trauma or a medical patient because he's unresponsive? Medical. That I'm gonna go with both of you. He... Keep going, Mac. Unless he or the bystander noticed that he fell and and caused injury to himself, that'd be trauma. Yeah, like if the if they saw so him falling in his head. Better. Yeah, so yeah, you should um, be able to. Yeah. Travis is saying trauma because you don't have enough to determine the otherwise. Um, and I don't know, mine's showing on Apple to everyone. Does anybody see that? Or it may just be somebody from their phone. So, uh, Travis is saying, did he hit his head without being seen by someone? You know, that's a good point. You, you know, it's now, are you going to run lights and sirens back to the hospital or are you just going to run a I call it a quick two. You know, it may just depends on what agencies you are. It's priority two for around us is, you know, no lights, no siren. But if you make it a quick priority two, is that, are y'all still good with that or y'all want to run lights and sirens because of the unknown? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, a lot I mean also, you do, do mental status. It all depends on his mental status. Hey man, that's a really good that's a really good point. Oh, right there. Trauma. Yeah. So then there's I mean, they said there, it's like, that's trauma. Yeah. Hey man, I'm gonna tell you. Um and then Victoria said it depends on his sats. He you know, his if his mental status is off. Uh when, and what were we gonna what's the acronym we're gonna use to check his mental status? I want to see. You can check his so, mental status by asking questions. Correct. Um, so we're going to check his AFPU. Y'all remember us going over that? So, Mac, I'm not saying that you're wrong, but no means you're you're correct because we're going to check his LOC. 
and we're going to check his AFPU. So when you write your report, they're going to want to know, was he alert to verbal, painful, or he was complete unresponsive? So he can be unresponsive, but to pain. So if I give him a painful stimuli, and he, you know, pulls into the core, like he's decorticate or he's posturing, that's, that's completely, we, we really don't want to see, you know, any of those. But if he's moving his hands in to try to get you, he is unresponsive, but responsive to pain. So AFPU and LOC, it's a great way to, to mark that in your chart. So when you get ready to write your uh, reports, you're going to want to take notice of all those informations. Uh, mental status is a big thing. What's another way that we can use, what tool can we use to also help us out there in this process? And I call it as, it should be in your bag, should be on your truck, that we always basically can turn around and use this tool to help us out. Anybody want to guess? As to what? So to check his mental status, and can help us build a case. Um, I may not ask the question right, so I'm going to tell you. It's the CBG, so we want to check his, his, his glucose and check his sugar. Well, if his sugar is super low, we might be able to fix that. So I yeah. probably didn't ask the question correctly. Is somebody saying something? All right, so we'll go to the next one. What are some important clues to focus on when assessing your patient, how to identify those? I think we just really hit those. Um, you all brought up some really good points. We're going to hit uh, your level of consciousness, your mental status, the AFPU. Um, we're going to see what his O2 sets are. That's kind of building our case when we're doing our assessment. So I think I'm going to skip number five. It's already, oh, I'm hitting buttons over here. Sorry. All right. So I have to move my screen again to read that. En route, you contact the hospital to provide a radio report about an unresponsive man suspected of being intoxicated and possibly having TB. We then perform a secondary assessment looking for more clues as the man's current condition. You notice the man has some redness and the conjunctive conjuncti of both eyes, but no trauma to the head or scalp. Anybody want to take a guess what that means? He can probably have kidney failure. Come on, keep talking. I like the way you're thinking. So I know somebody's going to Google it real quick. Uh, so I'm going to Google it with you. <laughs> I heard somebody, but I don't know what they said. Diabetic. Hey, diabetic. that's exactly what I was going for. That's why we were looking for your... Uh, so that's why I was looking for your CBG. Could be a diabetic. Now, he does also have alcohol. So some of your heavy alcoholics... Are they, they drink all day, do they thing. eat any? Yeah, also he can have liver failure. Yep, because the, uh, the redness in both eyes is also hinting for glaucoma. So he could turn around and, I mean, I think y'all are, you know what, I'm going to get this page, y'all are on the right track. So I think we're doing good. At least some, at least we're paying attention. That's what I'm going to for, because y'all are getting these questions when I'm, I ain't got nothing else to say. Um, Ahead, Mac, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Isn't he on the medication for rip? Correct. He's already on that medication. So, does anybody did anybody Google that medication to see what it was for? I mean, isn't it for TB? Is it antibiotic? Yeah. I'm gonna go right back here. And. Uh, Did I already pass it? There it is. Somebody look that up real quick. I'm circling it right here with my finger. Tell me what it is. So Victoria is saying alcohol turns to straight to sugar, and it's for TB. That is correct. I was hoping somebody would turn around and pick that up while I go when we were talking about it. So you already know he's TB positive. We, we get that. Um, we know what's going on. We, we already can suspect what's going on with his diabetes. Um, he's TB positive. 
and he smells like alcohol. His healthiness, his healthiness is shot. So it doesn't really matter really what we can we can't talk to him and tell him what he needs to do. He's he's made up his mind. He's not probably hasn't been taking that medicine like he should anyway, so it's gonna be a little different. Um right there where it says you don't notice any trauma or anything like that. Um so while listening to his chest you hear decreased breath sounds on the right lower part of the chest and crackles in the upper left. You notice uh, what may be some bodily spittum, bloody sputum on his shirt. His abdomen is soft but appears mildly distended. The pelvis is intact and no evidence of trauma to the extremities or back. Pulses are present in all extremities. So this could all this should tell you a lot right here. When we talk about, so you notice what may be some bloody sputum on his shirt. His abdomen, is, his abdomen is soft but appears distended, but he has no trauma. Then you're listening to breath sound. What, I mean, he sounds like he's drowning up there, doesn't he? What, what else are we thinking? Yeah. So, Travis, I'm just you, said, you want to treat his TB? Um, he he doesn't sound good, and I'm gonna tell you, and I. Even with what I found coming out of his pocket with the prescription, you don't want to be too close into his face too long. I've been exposed to TB. I'm telling you, I have a tracker to being exposed to almost everything in the world. But I've been exposed to TB. I've taken care of active page, active HIV patients. I actually, I say I had the pleasure, but it was an unfortunate pleasure of taking care of an Ebola patient. So, guys, it's... I'm, been around for a little bit unfortunately I've, I've taken the medicine for tb it's it's really big and it's it tastes horrible uh correct victoria tb is very very contagious so you're gonna have to automatically and this is something that may tell you later in the slides but if you treat that tb patient you gotta let the er know as fast as you get there because they start putting that medication they start putting the patient on medication and you also get put on the same medication and they treat you for 14 uh, i think i think it's 14 days um, but you come back to that facility to get tested and treated again. So they will test you. They'll probably get a 30 day TB uh, test. So let that sink in the back of your head to where if you are treating that TB patient because of what Tori was saying, it's very contagious. Understand that that's something you need to let them know and tell them, hey, I am transporting a active TB patient. Because they may hold you for a little bit because it's got to be a positive pressure room that this person goes to. And unfortunately, right now, with all of our COVID stuff going on, that you may have to sit out and wait in the truck with your patient for a little while until they get this room ready or they may send you to a different spot. Um, so, sorry, I have an animal that's touching me. I didn't wasn't ready for it sitting at the table. All right. So we know that. We've already read that. Uh Victoria, you're saying both you and your partner and the patient needs a mask on, correct? Uh, so, Victoria, I'm going to ask you when you're saying our patient a BVM, give me some more details yep. on what you're saying so I can pick up with what route you're going. If the patient's having breathing problems already because they have the TB, then they need a mask on, but they would need a BVM uh, so you could keep all that sputum and the droplets in the BVM, correct? Because when they start coughing, they're gonna, they're gonna fill up a lot, unfortunately. So uh, the patient would, uh, I would, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give both of y'all those answers. Mac, you were saying the patient would, Need a non rebreather. So it depends on what the patient's going to tolerate. If the patient's unresponsive and I, and I have time to do the BVM, it's a good idea because you can keep it all enclosed into the mask. Same thing with the uh, non rebreather. But if the patient starts vomiting, that creates a whole nother issue, starts throwing up sputum, a whole nother issue. So both of you are right depending on the circumstance of the patient, not saying this one specifically. But I was meaning if the patient was conscious and needed like yeah. the extra help to breathe. Of course, if the patient was conscious, they would need a non rebreather. They wouldn't need help yeah. ventilation. And, and I mean, not saying that it just may be uh, 
So they may be sluggish, and I'll give you both of y'all. Those are really good answers. I, I really wasn't expecting that, but y'all got me on that one. So let me give you credit on both there. Uh, let's see. All right. So what is the patient's injuries and problems? Oh, I had to move it. Sorry. I got screens all over so I can try to see everybody. Will the patient's injuries and problems always be clear? We're going to get clear, cut, and dry answers from this patient? No. We're going to see every injury that this patient, they these patients have. Mac, if that was you, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't want to cut you off. Go ahead. No, I would. I think you're probably going to get as much as you already got. On scene. And, you know, and you're going to have to figure the rest out. It's like Jeopardy. You can ask all the questions you want, but if you don't ask them in the right way, or do the right uh, do the right skills and tasks that you're not going to get no answers out of. If the cause of the patient's unconsciousness is unclear, what do you do? So do you treat this as a unresponsive medical patient or an unresponsive trauma patient like we talked about a while ago, but we talked more on the transportation? So how are we going to treat these patients? Was it, what are we, what would we do with the, uh, with the unclear of what really happened to this dude? I kind of treat them like both. Both of y'all got good answers. Uh, unresponsive trauma I patient, Thomas. I would do that one. Same thing. I unless guess you get a really good history. Assessment. Yep. Keep talking. I'm going to listen to you. you go through the trauma man. assessment. I, yeah. Uh, Sorry. I guess throw up the uh, possibility of any trauma. But. <laughs> Okay, so we can do that. We can treat them as a go through the trauma algorithm, and I'll call it that way. Um, and then we get there and we're like, okay, now we need to transport because you're doing a quick, rapid assessment. Your patient assessments are going to, once you get to the, once you build your assessment, they're all going to be the same. You just got to figure out, am I going left to the medical or right to the trauma? Just because you do a trauma assessment doesn't mean you got to do a, uh, you know, lights and sirens to the hospital, it helps you build your your plan of action a little bit faster. Uh, tells me what I'm able to get doing and what I need to do to get these people, you know, this particular person to the hospital. So I, I agree with you. Go with your trauma assessment. That's, that's going to help you. And it, you're going to make sure you check everything a little bit more because it's unconscious. Um, so... Prior to arrival to the hospital, you reevaluate the patient's vital signs and note they appear unchanged significantly from your baseline set. The patient is becoming more responsive by responding to painful stimuli when you apply a nail bed pressure with your pen. He continues to tolerate the nasal airway without a problem. However, he does have an occasional call. Look, I want I gotta change my camera. I'm gonna look at y'all. If he's coughing, put something on his face. Cover it up. I don't want his cooties. None of y'all want his cooties. Y'all let him keep them. So with the occasional call, that's his TB is going to act up. You probably once in a while may see if you happen to move that mask off of him, you may see some some blood particulates. Uh, you may see worst case scenario, you're going to see some some pink chunks, and that's part of his lungs that's breaking out. Um, but y'all make sure cover their face. Keep them to keep their stuff. We, we don't want none of y'all to get that back. All right. So how would you record his lack of change in the patient's condition and vitals? So when you're writing your report, I don't know if anybody's ever written a medical report before, um, but if you write your reports and you're going to reevaluate. Okay, right there. How would you, how often should you assess this patient's vitals? So let's go with that one first. Number nine, how often are we going to assess these vitals for this patient? 15 minutes. I think, okay, I was going to say, because I think y'all are leaning towards the trauma assessment. So, Travis, like you're saying, that's giving you a five minutes. But if or we do five minutes. As a med so you're not really wrong on doing it either or. So I, I'll give you that because you're assessing your patient consistently and you're always re rechecking them. What were you saying? I check them every – if it's trauma, I do every five minutes, mm -hmm. five to – and, but if it's standard call, 15 minutes, 
every 15 minutes. And every agency's different on their monitor, on their pre-program uh, monitor times. So if it's a trauma, you got a bunch of other crap going on, and you got to remember to reach over there and get that vitals again. Yep. Um, that's the reason why I'm really big on saying, hey, fire's here. All right, who wants to ride? And they look at me like it's just unresponsive. To you, it is, yes. But you ain't, I'm not, don't turn down no help, y'all. I'm going to tell you. So, right here on number eight. Standing or they all stay. Go, Mac, what were you saying? All stay stations every 30. I said, our standing orders say uh, stable patients every 30 minutes, critical patients every 10 as, as treatment for them. Uh, what state you in, Mac? Indiana, Northeast Indiana. Okay. So, that's really, I mean, honestly, that's covering it the best way in other because y'all probably have a long transport time and trying to record, you know, bottles every, you know, 15 minutes. That's a lot. So it's in there. Um, so when you were doing a 30 minutes, I have, I think that's a great idea. Um, Mac, are y'all rural or metro? Rural. Our okay. is trauma unit is an hour away in Fort Wayne. Okay. And guys, y'all, that's a good point. I mean, think about listen to from wherever we're from. If you're from a rural area or a metro area, that's a good point. You got 30 minutes on a medical patient. I think that's a great idea. Um, sorry, y'all, my earphone died. Um, but that's a that's a good deal. Go ahead and think about that. Um, that's awesome. So what additional assessments uh, would you conduct over the next few minutes going to the hospital? As we're transporting this guy, what else is important to y'all? Make sure his O2 set still the same. Right. So are we still heart rate? Now, so with this guy's being a TB patient, are we expected his sats to be 95 and above or 95 and below? Uh, he, yeah, y'all. He's gonna be. His normal is probably hypoxic. He's probably automatically gonna be a low sat reader anyway, and that he's having a, I call it a TB episode, you're, you're going to see some low sats. Um, sorry, y'all. Like I said, I just got home and I feel it come running out, so kind of just got me off guard for a second. Um, so you're going to see those low sats. Uh, you're going to want to check those. I think what we've, besides, you know, the assessments that's normally there, I think y'all have Y'all are on the right track. I finally believe that y'all are picking up your assessments, um, patient assessments. If you also look at your national registry checkout sheet, they big, but get used to it. I don't remember who said it the other night about grabbing your, you should never get other children, family members and make them be your patient. That's probably, I still talk about that the other day. I, I think that's a great idea. Um, and do that and it'll help you with your patient assessment. Um, so here, this was a challenging patient because of the lack of information provided by, the, if any, provided by the patient. Although this patient appeared to be a medical patient and not trauma patient, it's often difficult to, difficult to tell. Like we said, we went, we all, I think we all kind of agreed to go ahead and treat it as a medical, as a trauma assessment, and um, but treat it as a medical patient. I think that's perfect. I think y'all did an awesome job there. Um, he may have hit his, been hit by a car instead of falling and hit his head, like y'all said a while ago. We didn't see anything on our assessment, but it's not been ruled out. Uh, any history obtained from the patient with, a, with altered level of consciousness, we're not really going to believe that because is he truthful? Is he honest? Does he even know what planet he's on right now? So finally, the patients do not have to be a trauma patient or, uh, or medical patients exclusively. You can... I think like y'all were on the same track as you'll go in to the trauma assessment and then you're like, okay, well then you want to do more detailed, you can do it. So back and forth, picking up and pulling out of which ones that y'all want to do on those assessments, I think is great. Uh, you got in a good idea of it. Um, I think you're there. Um, uh, let me see now. I'm going to try to get out of this one. Do y'all have any quick questions or any concerns about the, uh, about going over the patient assessment here. Uh, 
I know I may be dating myself, but y'all remember the old show, Ferris Bueller's Day Off? I feel like when I ask you a question, I'm like, Bueller? Bueller? Yeah. Just waiting. So I'm showing my age there. I apologize. All right, let me try to change um, from this one to the next one. Look at there. Oh, and just to let y'all know, I have to tell y'all, I had a retard moment the other day. So I was using the slideshows that y'all pointed out in, um, from the EMTA version, but you know what that means? I was just ready, preparing y'all for the next step. So that's really what it was. But now we're on the right track. All right, so part one, we're going to go over this one real quick. So it is a warm summer day outside. The temperatures are, are mild and rain and it's in the forecast. You're sitting with your partner when the call comes in to uh, University Ambulance to respond to the lobby of Maple Tree Hotel for a man with respiratory distress. And then it's a little detail right there. Approximately one out of every four EMS calls is either airway or respiratory related. So they go hand in hand. So your airway, respiration, your ABCs need to be assessed probably before you kind of introduce yourself. You can introduce yourself and then turn around and if they respond, you know, you got a clear airway. They are breathing and obviously they're having some circulation. So you can assess those from without having to touch your patient first. Oops, sorry, beeping in my ear over here. All right. So why is it critical? to maintain a patient's airway and ensure adequate breathing at all times. So they stay alive. Okay. I remember me telling you the other night I'm addicted to breathing. There ain't much out there in this world I'm addicted to, but that's the number one thing I'm addicted to. So I like my patients to be alive when I pick them up and alive when I drop them off. It's a lot easier to pay for it. Y'all remember that. So how frequently should you assess the condition of a patient's airway and his or her ability to breathe? So. I I'm not saying with your assessment, but, you know, Q5 or Q10, but how how often are we going to assess their airway? Pretty often. Constant. Constantly. Uh, and pretty often, so we can check. Uh, you can... Go ahead. Just by looking at them, uh, they're struggling, so... To breathe adequately and then you can adjust what you're doing yeah and just keeping an eye on your patient you don't have to sit on the jump seat that's beside them you can sit in what we call it the captain seat uh, in the back of the truck but just watch your patient watch the monitor if you have them on the you know if you have them on a three lead depends on which if your agency allows the basics to put them on there or if you put them on an o2 set and look at it uh, watch your respirations, watch your peaks of your O2 sats, and just watch them all and then keep a visual idea of your patient. Um, what impact will it, uh, what impact will inappropriate, uh, inappropriate assessment and management of a patient's airway and breathing have a, on a total patient care? So if you don't assess the patient's airway, if you don't keep, you know, an eye on it, Ultimately, I think Mac pointed out, we want to keep them alive. So if you don't do it, your patient's going to go to respiratory arrest. What's that might say in some? I'm sorry, Robin, I didn't hear you. I apologize. I was just agreeing, let you know that it would drive it. Yeah. So. Keep an eye on it, uh, monitor your patient, watch them. If they're not doing too good, guess what? Your report's just gonna get a lot longer because, because of your actions. All right, so in route to the hotel, you consider the potential cause of your patient's respiratory distress. Could it be an asthma attack, a heart attack? Could there be some sort of trauma preventing him from breathing well? Uh, does he have a history of it? I, like, uh, these are things going through your head, or should be. You're pleased that you, uh, you're pleased that you thoroughly checked your respiratory equipment and and the oxygen cellars before you left the station that morning. You uh, being put you began putting your gloves on. So go to that. You should always assess. You should always check all your equipment. I don't know what companies you work for. The ones in the past, I've worked for some that you have to check every single item that's on the list and sign off on it. 
I've worked for some agencies that put little pull tags on there. If the pull tag is on there, it's been checked by somebody and it's been signed off. Um, I've worked for other agencies that each crew has an assigned bag and that bag is, has to be checked by that crew. So the ongoing crew takes their bag out there. The offgoing crew takes their bag off. So make sure you know your equipment, you've checked your equipment and just be on top of your game. That's very helpful. Um, so what are the specific causes of respiratory distress? What are serious and which are not? So somebody tell me what is a serious respiratory distress? All right. Sorry, I was looking at something. So an in end-stage COPD, you're going to have your pink puffers, your blue boaters. Uh, you're going to see those. Um, you know, anybody that's having a panic attack or anybody that's having trouble breathing, that's respiratory stress. To me, if I start to lose my, my addiction, bro, I'm, I'm going to be struggling over here, I can tell you. So I want to make sure that I breathe just as much as my patient does. My patient's got, you know, are they 12 to 16 times a minute? If not, if they're struggling, what can I do to help them? Uh, so what type of equipment are we going to need to treat this patient with difficulty breathing? What should you take off of the truck and bring to that patient? Uh, oxygen and... Um, um, you should take your oxygen, you should have masks, and you should take a suction canister. Yeah, unfortunately, we, uh, we kind of want to take the bag. We want to take everything in there because it's really going to look bad on you as an individual, as a healthcare provider, your agency, if you ever got to get up and go out to the truck and get some shit that you forgot. So it's easier to load the stretcher down and get somebody to help you take it out versus, oh, I need to run back and get that suction because now this guy's coded and I don't have my stuff. What if it's on the other side of the hotel and your truck's on the front? So think about those things. I, I'm a real big person to I kind of overtake things. So remember that. So I guess you're going to say we're going to take the truck inside with us because I can have the tools that I need. Um, as you arrive at the hotel, you're greeted by the security who reported the man was attending a conference when suddenly he began complaining of difficulty breathing and confusion. He passed out in his chair. The security officer informed you that the ushers have carefully moved him uh, into the aisle and they're keeping his airway open. So with that being said, what are y'all autom what are y'all pre-gaming? What are you expecting on the front end? Lack of oxygen. Uh, what about allergic reaction? What about an exposure to something? Is there an obstruction? Good point. What if he's, let's say they're eating lunch and this dude's allergic to peanuts and there's a meal that's in there. Victoria, good point. You got drugs. Um, what are some of the other things that we're talking about? Um, let's think, unfortunately, and the day and age and time that we're in, could there be a terrorist effect? Could there be a chemical exposure? Um, let's see, Travis, let me catch up on this chat real quick. Uh, confusion could be a bleed. Good point. That was a good one. Uh, asthma, choking. So we want to keep all those things in the back of our mind. And you're just like, oh, man, he's kind of sadistic. He thinks all kind of crazy stuff. No, I've seen some crazy stuff. So I'd rather be over-prepared instead of unprepared. Uh, let's change. All right. As you walk into the room, you notice that the conference session is on break. So a few people are standing around, and there is no immediate hazard. You don't feel threatened. You don't feel like, oh, I need RPD instead of hotel security. You see only one large patient who appears to be unresponsive. You ask your partner to call the dispatch and send to ALS. So... Kudos on the crew already because they're realizing that one is they're probably going to need some extra assistance picking this person up. Because if it says a large patient, my large, your large is probably different. Um, 
but they're automatically looking for extra resources. They realize this patient is unresponsive on the floor, so they may need some ALS airway maneuvers. Um, how long? Uh, how does the information given by the hotel security and bystanders how help you prepare? What did they say that made you keep your assessment in your head already? Is there something that they said that has already made you start thinking a certain thing? Makes you having trouble breathing. Yeah. Matt, go ahead. I'll cut you off. Makes you consider it's more medical than any trauma. Just right off okay. the get-go. Okay. So you don't see anything. People people aren't freaking out. You don't have the waving willy standing around saying, oh, hurry, hurry, hurry this way. Kind of gives you the idea that somebody's already, that he's potentially still breathing. Uh, the security or the, the ushers were helping him open his airway. So... Either he was trying to slump over and they've got him leaned back with his head back. So he's breathing at the time, okay? So that kind of gives you an idea. Uh, is he having trouble breathing and confused? Uh, check pulse immediately to see if they have one. I mean, that's just as important as doing an assessment instead of trying to figure out if this, if this dude's coded or not so you don't know if there's an assessment. What are some potential hazards that you see in this situation? I mean, the only thing that I see as a hazard is, is it says a large guy. So that may be your only thing is trying to figure out what to, you know, I need some extra resources. There may be hard to pick him up um, due to his size, his, his or her size. That's, um, there we go. So the usher, the usher stepped out of the way as you kneel beside your patient. You confirm with the ushers that the patient, in fact, did not fall out of his chair but they lifted him out carefully. You then open his airway using the head tilt chin lift and listen for breathing. You hear snoring respirations that persist even after adjusting his head and position. You decide to use an OPA to keep his airway open. So quick move there, you've got everything situated. I, at this point, I don't know what's going on, but his airway is secured because you can put an OPA in He's head tilt, chin lift. There is no trauma. So we're kind of stepping down from the trauma side. We're going to go and say, oh, I'm not real sure. But you're kind of putting X's in boxes instead of checks in a box. You kind of pick up what I'm saying there. So we want to make sure we're, we're doing our assessment, but we're checking in X and things to make sure we're on the right track. Um, what is the most appropriate method to open an unresponsive patient's airway when you are considering a chief complaint? Uh, of difficulty breathing what's the one airway that we can do or what is how are we going to open their airways jaw thrust jaw thrust is one uh head tail chin lift is one um anybody else have an idea just insert the airway can we can we put them in the uh the recovery position Yeah. Okay. Um, Victoria saying jaw thrust, head tilt, chin lift, OPA, NPA. We can use all those. Those are some of the things that we're going to, uh, the track we're going down. Several minutes after inserting the oral airway, your patient begins to gag and vomits. So what does that right there automatically tell you? Is that accepting it well? Okay. So they were unresponsive initially because you could put the OPA in. Because if they're responsive, 99% of your patients aren't going to take the OPA if they're conscious. So if he's now starting to gag it and gag on it and vomits, that tells you he may be coming around. So you immediately remove the airway, the oral airway, and roll the patient to his side. When he finishes vomiting, you clean the large debris. Oh, I'm sorry, y'all. I can't stand vomit. There's a lot of things <laughs> I do in my life, but I don't do vomit. So your partner has to set up a portable suction for you. Like she said, Victoria, you said we brought it in. So right there, she's saying, I see it. I just had to scroll over. 
uh, pull it out and get the suction ready. She called it up automatically. So as you reevaluate the patient's breathing and airway, you now hear gurgling sounds. Before I click over, what's happened? His puke wet his nose. So he's puked, but he's aspirated. So what you, even though you've suctioned it out and you're doing your best to get the debris out, I'm gonna leave it just like that, is that now he's aspirated. So you're you're fighting an uphill battle. And now you you kind of they take it off from you because with them aspirating, it's gonna be worse. But you already jumped the gun and called for an ALS unit. So kudos to you because now you have an advanced services on the way that you can do an advanced airway in just a few minutes. Oh, come on. All right, so you grab a rigid tip catheter, turn the machine on, use this mouth. Okay, so they're trying to tell you to use the cross finger technique to keep his mouth and uh, you put it right on the inside of the gum to keep his mouth open. After measuring the depth of the catheter against the patient's face, you insert the catheter in the patient's mouth and begin counting the seconds. After 10 seconds, are ready? I'm going to say that again. After 10 seconds, the mouth appears clear and the fluids and the gurgling has stopped. Perfect. What you did, how you did it, you done done the right thing. How about that? So we've cleared the potential aspiration. He's got his gag, his gurgling has stopped. We're on the right track. We're, we're moving in a good direction now. So we catching up this uphill battle. How important is it to reevaluate the interventions you use to treat your patient on this particular patient right here? How important is it for you to consistently reassess that airway? Very. Oh, very. Very. Like you said earlier, on the other guy, because they're going to die. So we don't want this dude. We want to keep him alive, keep a good track record consistently. You don't have to be sitting there and be like, is he breathing? I'm listening to him. Is he breathing? So keep your eye on it. Just make sure you pay attention. Watch your patient. You know, um, if your suction catheter does not remove the large debris from the patient's mouth, how are we going to remove it? Here comes a good one. What are y'all going to yeah, use to remove it? that? Say that one more time, Mac. Do that with your gloved fingers. <laughs> All right. So, look, I'm going to change my screen here. So, I got 10 fingers. I like them, right? Mac, I'm, I'm going to pick on you for a second, okay? Because you spoke up. You like your 10 fingers? Don't. Ever, 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 ever stick your fingers in somebody's mouth. Because unconsciously, if they do it in a diabetic situation and they clamp down, bruh, you ain't coming out. You're going to come out like this. Be like, you know, Mike had 10 fingers a while ago, but now you created an obstruction in their airway. I'm picking on you. I'm not making fun of you. Please understand. We're we joking. So they have these things that are called McGill forceps. Uh, you should have them in your bag, your, on your unit, your uh, fire truck. Uh, if you haven't, I know I have some around here at the house, but I was not prepared to show you. I have them all sure I can show you out there. So it's it's just like the little tweezers, but they're long and curved. And they like the fingers going down here, and there's a clip in that's down here, and you can reach into their mouth and do that. So McGill forceps is the only way that you want to reach in there and grab anything out, uh, because I ain't putting my fingers in nobody's mouth. I can promise you that. Um, I'm trying Jesus. to take my earphones. Go ahead. Use a spoon. Something that's hard. Something besides them, them, them ten fingers. Just use anything else. Uh, all right. Now that you have, what time is it? We're gonna go over this slide and we'll take a break. Uh, now that you have cleared your patient's airway by suctioning, you place the patient in the recovery position. Bam! We called it already. We can put him in that position, and you continue your assessment. After he's, uh, after you you find his breathing to be persistent, uh, present, and adequate, a pulse is present, and there is no evidence of bleeding. Uh, findings from your secondary assessment are normal, except that there's a low pulse of 88. So a low pulse ox, a little low. So with that just being a, his low pulse ox, what are we going to do on a, to, to fix that? Because now he is hypo or hyper uh, oxemia. Hypo. He's hypo. Victoria, we can put him on oxygen. 
how much oxygen are we going to put them on? So Travis is saying two liters of O2. Anybody else? Six liters nasal cannula. All right. Let's go with two liters. Let's rock on and see what we're going to do from there. What is another alternative that we could do? So if he's hypoxemia, if he's hypoxic, and we got to do something to fix that, so if we don't fix it more aggressively, what's going to happen? One drop. One drop. Uh, have him to take some slow deep breaths and expand his lungs. He could go into respiratory arrest. I'm going to say he's early stages of respiratory distress at this time. Um, but can you go and stop eating Orbeez? Oh, my God. Literally. So Come on, girl. I'm trying to figure out what you're talking to me about eating. <laughs> so, listen. Let's, let's, let's attack. I was busy at school huh? and forgot it was in. <laughs> forgot it. Good, in the hey, I'm you take care of it. I'm trust me, kids are way more important. I say the family's the best. She's smart enough to realize she can't Arby's. I bet she ain't. She's done. Travis, I'm gonna lean more towards you just initially as mine as I can put them on 15 liters of non rebreather for 5, 10, 15 minutes. If I can get that O2 sat up and keep it maintained, then I would swap them over to a nasal cannula. Now you can go ahead and put them on that nasal cannula, and if you realize that it's not doing the best, swap them over to a mask, uh, a non rebreather mask, and put them at 15 liters. You can alternate. You can plug and you can put him either one in there, and you can which one he's able to maintain. Victoria brings a good point. So, what if he needs an assistance? We can bag. We can bag him. Um, a lot of people freak out when you start pulling the bags because you know the TV shows always do it the wrong way. I mean, the right way. I mean, yeah, they make it look good, but it's never the right way. So, you may need to just give them assistance. Uh, you don't want to give too much oxygen because it can do more harm than good. Okay. We're not going to see the harmness of the O2 in, in the field. So when you say that, not knowing if they have COPD uh, or if they have any other lung disease or I say lung issues, putting them on 15 liters for the next 30, 45 minutes or giving them 15 liters of assisted breathing with the back bow mask is not going to hurt. But Mac, I'm sorry, Travis, that is a good point. In a long standing time, you could potentially cause harm, but in a short time that we're with them, um, Mac, I'm, I'm gonna ask you a question again. You say you're a rural area. How long is it a, what's the transport time on average to your uh, facilities? You're local? Yeah, so if you're local, let's say you said you were rural, so if you're transporting somebody, what's your average transport time on an ambulance up there? I mean, we have one right in our, our town, but okay. we have two AIM staff. So, I mean, that's far on the far west side. So, if it's on the northwest side of the county, it could take 15, 20 minutes to go get to our our hospital. Okay. And, so, and like around here, we are very, we're rural in the town that I live in. Um, our yeah. ambulance service has. Six ambulances in the county that I live in, seven ambulances the county north of here, and they all kind of mingle back and forth. And we can be at any facility, trauma center hey. to a, from Band Aid Station to a trauma center, and maybe twelve minutes on That's average. Right so our transport times is a little bit longer uh, in some of your rural areas. So when I say a long transport time, I'm talking about like hours. I mean, I, I have a good friend of mine that lives out in Colorado, and he's transported a patient and has taken him over three and a half hours to get to a hospital. So that being said is, Travis, I hope that kind of answered your questions to kind of give you an idea. You can give them the oxygen. You can give them high flow. But for the amount of time that we're potentially going to be with them, it's not going to harm them. Um, I hope that helped you out a little bit. I wasn't trying to go off on a tantrum, but honestly, I was trying to kill like three more minutes so I can give you all a 10-minute break. Do y'all have any questions for me right now? Uh, we're going to take 10 minutes and we'll come back at 10 after. Uh, but y'all are doing awesome. I uh, appreciate y'all's feedback. 
Um, y'all are always on the, all of y'all are on the right track. Y'all are, you know, kind of building off each other. And I really appreciate that. Uh, it's helping out a lot. Um, so let's take, uh, Travis, 15 minutes to your local, but one hour to the nearest trauma center. That's a ride. And hopefully you can go by air on that part. All right, guys. So now I've talked a little bit longer. I will see you at 7-Eleven. I'll come back on and we'll start there. All right. We'll see you all in a minute. All right.
All right, everybody, we're back. Just somebody give me a heads up, a uh, little question mark, dot mark on there so you know, we know how y'all can hear me. Yay. All right, so we already hit that one. We're going to go on to the next one. All right, so you place your patient on a non-rebreather um, at 15 liters per minute and prepare the patient to transport to the hospital. Dispatch, dispatch reports that the ALS unit is delayed due to uh, traffic construction. So I don't know if any of y'all know, been through um, Jackson, Mississippi area and um, Highway 49. That's not uncommon. Trust me. If you're coming through Highway 49 and they call traffic delay, that's probably going to be for the next 50 years. So that's it's going gonna, it's gonna to be common. So now you're stuck with a patient that needs ALS interventions. Um, you're going to need some ALS support and they're delayed. All right. So here's our questions. The patient needs oxygen. What type of patients should not receive oxygen? So this is going back to your statement earlier. Um, let me. So Travis, this is what you were talking about earlier that may or may not be good. Um, they are asking just so we know what type of patients do we not want to give them to. You addressed that earlier. Um, some in-state COPD patients potentially may not need high flow of two. Um, and you may set them up in a 45 degree or, you know, 50 degree or sorry, 45 to about a 60 area. They don't have to be 90 that they can get assessments and all that a little bit clearer for their respirations and it may pick up for themselves. Earlier in your assessment, you called for additional help, but now that your help is delayed, how does this change your immediate decisions towards the patient care? Or does this does this change in how rapid we're going to do something or if we're going to delay to do something? Is this going to do anything for y'all's decision right now that ALS has been delayed? Y'all are right on that. So while y'all are trying to answer that question, uh, Victoria and Lieta saying COPD patients it should be given to and should not be given to over long periods of time. That's correct. Um, so that's that's the answer that they're looking for. They're probably going to ask that question and some form of weird way on a test question or anything like that. So y'all be prepared to read those questions very well. Um, so back to my question here, what is anything going to change now that your uh, ALS care is being delayed? Are you going to try to treat more aggressively for some, for the airway or treat the patient more aggressively in what kind of passion that we're waiting? Load and go. I can't, I can't argue with you there. Um, knowing that I'm going to base a truck and let's just say I'm 15 minutes down the road. If you're, you know, been there for a while and you got the confidence of, you know, I can handle this patient. Uh, I feel very confident I can handle it. And I'm not worried about it. Get on and go. I don't see a reason to sit around and wait. Um, excuse me. We don't know how long our um, ALS care is going to be delayed for. But I would rather not delay on scene. I would just rather get up and in, in, in the in the ambulance and go straight to the hospital. Now I would probably run up a licensed iron to the hospital at that point and go ahead and call the hospital before I leave and say, Hey, look, this is what I'm coming in. Um, ALS care has been delayed and we're gonna be transporting, you know, let's just say priority one, code one, whatever you decided. Uh, Victoria, uh, Victoria, possibly decline in the patient should be assessed often if patient is crashed and called med flight. If you're close enough, uh, I know here in the Metro Jackson area, it's got to be longer than a 10 minute drive for med flight to come out. So if you're, it depends on where you're at and follow your protocols or procedures for each one, understand what their, what the med flight's restrictions are. Um, I'm okay with them having those restrictions because at the same time, unfortunately, everybody's for a for-profit uh, business out there. And this module that we want to make sure that it's benefit of the patient to wait for the air med and not to sit there and delay and be like, oh, what's well, going to be better because they get there? Well, you could have halfway been to the hospital by the time you waited on air med. So just know your policy and your procedures for those, your areas. All right. So part seven, despite supplemental oxygen therapy, your patient's condition has deteriorated. He is more cyanotic and has shallow shallow, slow respirations. You insert a NPA 
and began assisting his ventilations at one breath every five seconds with a bag valve mask attached to 100% supplemental oxygen. He did not resist your attempts to ventilate him and his, his chest rise and falls with each ventilation. He tolerates the nasal airway and dispatch reports that paramedics will rendezvous in five minutes. Is an airway adjunct needed to provide assistance ventilation with a bag valve mask? And how does this help? In your life. I mean, you could, if it, but I mean, if it's the NPA is working with your bag valve mask, you don't really have to change anything unless you have more stuff to do searching a fleet. I think the way this question is asked, and I, I'm going to agree with you, is that do you need to put a adjunct in to use the bag valve mask? And how does that help? So if you put one in, is it more helpful or less helpful? That's the way that I read it. More helpful. I'll agree with you. Because let's just say I'm putting an OPA in. I don't know if y'all, let me change screen so y'all can see. So if that's the hole that you're putting into their nose, I'll make it bigger so we can say there, versus what I've got, I'm clearing the airway for the NPA to go down. So that way I know no matter what, there's an unrestricted route to go into my nose and into my lungs versus what we have now is you're just hoping when you do a head tilt chin lift, that there's no blockage on the inside. So putting an NPA or an OPA, it does help with the ventilations and it, it helps move the tongue out of the way when you do an OPA. NPA, you're just making sure that there's a, the opening that's unrestricted. So you don't have to use them, but they do help. They're a tool in the tool bag. Uh, the patient's condition is deteriorating and you have begun ventilations at, at one every five seconds. Is that enough? Do I need to up it? And how do you know if the ventilations are effective? Sorry, y'all. My son's sitting next to me. And he just, I'm just laughing at him. So even though we have no restrictions when we ventilate him, but the patient's going down. So what we're doing is working, but he's getting worse. Well, somebody's saying something that I accidentally cut you off. All right, so obviously the one in every five seconds may not be working, so we need to to bag him more often. So if we're bagging this guy and we start noting gastric distension, what's that a telltale sign of? That he's getting air into his stomach rather than into his lungs. So you need to reevaluate. You're going to have to do... Do another head tilt chin lift or check your OPA or NPA and you may be bagging too forcefully. So because you're starting to freak out a little bit and that you're like, oh, man, whatever I'm doing is not working. Oh, my God. Where's the paramedics? They need to hurry up. You may just literally start doing this. And that may be not what you need to do. So slow it down. Take a deep breath. Breathe. Bag the patient every time you breathe and breathe normal. That's a key point. Just because you're bagging and when you do, don't hold your breath because that's what's going to happen. I promise you. I've seen it. All right. So Would you put a two, commie tube? Go ahead. Would you put a combi tube in? I'm going to pull that to the class. What do you guys think? Would y'all drop a combi tube on this guy? If your protocols allow it. Anybody else? And I wouldn't do it because he has a gag reflex, so he's not going to tolerate the combi tube. Okay. See, this is the reason why I try to put y'all vocally instead of just listening to my retarded self, because I like that question. I, I, I'm one of the guys that I like a good conversation, uh, and I'm not going to say that Putting a comma tube is a bad idea. It's something to keep in your mind that you may need to do it. But 
they just brought up really good points. It's got a gag reflex. So I like classroom discussions, and I feel like this being – I'll turn your mics on – has helped to where we can actually do that. We can have these discussions and saying, okay, why would you do that versus this? What will – you know, I think that's an idea that has helped. So I give it to y'all on that one that is saying that I give it a good point. So with that being said is, Mac, I'm just going to say that's not a bad idea to keep that idea into your brain about putting the comedy tube down because you can have it. You can have that tool ready. You can have it pulled out and you could be ready to use it if this patient goes south. You notice he's already going down. He's becoming cyanotic. So we got to step up to the next level. His level of consciousness has improved, but he's not getting ventilated because of right here. Y'all see that? He's become cyanotic. So y'all tell me what cyanosis is. Not enough oxygen to the brain. The lips are starting to turn. The nail beds are starting to turn. Probably his fingers are cold. So if you touch your patient, you're going to be there. So you continue to bag mass, uh, use bag mass ventilations to maintain adequate tidal volume, and you rendezvous with the paramedics to intubate the patient and assist you with transportor, transportation to the hospital where he's diagnosed with a stroke. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I'm going to lean back towards combi tomb. It's not a bad idea. But let's look at it this way. They brought up the point that he does have a gag reflex and his level of consciousness is improving. The inability, the, the ability that, you, that the paramedics have to use a sedation versus not what we have as basics is a problem. So I, you're on that line when you're saying, I'm going to use a combi tube. Well, they brought up good reasons to question you about that. And if it's your patient and you can make that decision, Stick with it. If you say, no, look, what I'm seeing is this patient's going down fast, and I want to secure the airway before there is no security in the airway, things will be kind of hard to argue with you on that point. But again, the ladies brought up a point that well, he already he's already gagging because of his gag reflex. So I'm gonna give y'all kudos to, to, to those two those answers. Um, following a two-day stay in the hospital, the patient was discharged to an extended care facility for continued recovery. Good job. So many factors uh, contribute to respiratory problems. Some are simple and seasonal allergies. Um, it's just going to happen a lot. We're getting ready to change seasons. Uh, obviously, we're having six more weeks of winter because the animal got to see a shadow. So I don't know how you're going to look at that. Either you don't like the cold weather. I look at it as, as I don't have to cut my grass for six more weeks. So other factors are complex, such as a uh, trauma, stroke. Uh, and some exposure, which that's what we talked about in the beginning for the industrial exposure. Was it uh, chemical related? Was it a terrorist activity? We, we got to think about all those. So oftentimes in the situation, maybe different on scene from what dispatch is reported. I mean, y'all know I'm going to have to pick. My wife's not in there, so I have to say it. My wife is a dispatcher. They're only telling her she was. They can only tell you what they hear. They can't make it up. They can't tell you anything else than what the caller makes. So just because your dispatcher tells you one thing and you see another thing, don't, when I, I'm going to use a term, don't be that guy and be like, well, dispatch, we're on scene of a four-car MVC instead of that single car that y'all reported. They, they don't know that. So, and remember, keep your dispatchers happy because at the end of the day, you may not get off on time because of them. And they may have forgot about to move you to a different post. Um, and dispatchers, uh, where it says uh, the caller is real good about lying to dispatchers. I was just going to say the dispatchers are good about lying because my wife walked in. But it, we know that. We've all been to those situations to where the call taker is just going to tell you what they say. Or once they start QA in the call to, to figure out which lane it's going to go to, it may change. Uh, and then some agencies will dispatch you to, uh, you know, 911, 911 being taken at this time, but here's the address. They're going to soft roll you that way because it can help reduce the response times. So all those things are there. Or if they say to an unknown, I really hate those. Well, you're on spawn and probably one to an unknown. Then why are you sending me? Oh, somebody. Oh. <laughs> 
Oh, it's all right. Oh. I burned it. Yeah, I got out of school. Forgot um, about it. So think about that. Don't be ugly to dispatch. I'm. A, that's my ten seconds on uh, important about dispatch because dispatch can only go with what they got. It still tastes good. It's just a little crispy. All right. <laughs> yep. So keep yep. it in mind. I'm sorry, Matt. What was that? I'll think. But you haven't heard bad unless you come up here. Hey, look, I can't help that fucking meat comes like that. I don't feel like when that fucking pork meat it comes like yeah. that in the Come pack. to Mississippi, too. You got to remember, it's we, we have our fair share. We just see it. It's the same issues. It's just a different color uh, truck and a different color uniform. We all have those issues. A lot of spice I'm trying to figure out who's, and I can try to mute it, but I don't know. Original uh, freaking season. i to make my own. Yeah, Victoria, I'm agree. I just don't know how to how to mute that. It has a perfect amount of season in it for the whole. Give me a second. It's apple. It's apple. How's that? Is that better? Did I get that situated? Yes. All right. I have the ability to yeah. mute whom and whatever else. I just have to. It takes me a second. All right. So here's the last little tidbit on this one. Keep an open mind to all possibilities to help you get better assesses and manage your patients. Few situations will require more equipment and serious problems with an airway or breathing. Inspect your equipment. This just can't be said any more clear than this. Check your stuff out before you go out of the station, out of the firehouse, on a call. Check it out. If it, some agencies will allow you if it takes you 30 minutes to come in 30 minutes early just to get it situated. Just remember that. Um, so if it's not working, replace it because it could be your family that that equipment's taken care of so that's my 10 cents on that one too uh let's see uh so the summary of many hazards may exist on a call in particular you should be cautious of well unusual odors um i'll leave that for what the book said and the involvement of multiple people if you have multiple people you need multiple units call multiple units that's what they're there for we all get paid the same so information from event individuals on scene can help you to remain safe. Uh, they give you a better understanding of what's going down, what the situation is. The assessment and treatment of an airway breathing problems always begins with securing an adequate airway. That's the reason why I wasn't trying to say using of the combi tube was a bad idea because I've waited too long on securing an airway. Um, I, I couldn't get an airway in because I was scared to make the decision to sedate them to put the airway down. Now, I've gotten to the point where I've been burned once, it won't happen again. I'll sedate somebody in a second and put an airway in. Because I know that we knew the outcome of the first call. It's one of those, you learned and burned, you learn because you got burned. So if you feel that that's your decision and that's what you saw and you say, you would go with it. Nobody's gonna argue with you. Um, they may teach you something but if they don't teach you and they fuss at you, then it's bad on them for not teaching you anything. Um, let's see. When treatment is provided, oh, where's my mouse? Uh, careful revaluation of a patient is needed to ensure that treatment is effective. So let's say we put that combi tube in. Let's say we marked it at the teeth. How are you going to know that it's going to stay in place, guys? How are y'all going to make sure that you kept it in the right place? Inflate it. Say that one more time. I'm sorry. That might be a dumb answer, but just to make sure you inflate the uh, either one of the uh, rings. No, I, bro, I'm not gonna call that a stupid answer at all. I think that's that's on point. You gotta remind to inflate that because now you're just crapped in your pants because this dude turns south and you're like, oh my god, I'm gonna copy to me real fast. Well, did you have the syringe with you when you put the combi tube in or when you checked your equipment, did you lay that syringe down on the table as you're checking everything else out? So I, I, I think that's great. Um, I think that's a really good suggestion right there. So uh, upon clocking in, you should check your truck and, and bags before starting shifts. Hey, uh, that's a great idea. Like we talked about, make sure you know you got your equipment, your stuff. I'm real big on rubber bands and stuff together. Um, I know what, uh, like Mac blade, when I go to in innovate somebody, I have two favorite ones that I always go to. I have a certain size tube that I go to and I always take my syringes that I need to inflate those bulbs. 
and I use a rubber band around it because I don't really care if the rubber band pops away. I don't really care if it flies off and I never get it back, but it keeps my equipment together. So know your equipment, know where it's at, and don't fumble through your stuff. Um, all right, so that's that one. Does anybody have any questions on uh, on what we just went over for all of that? Uh, I know it was airway. I know it was kind of fast, um, but I'm trying to let y'all have the ability to get some questions in, um, answer some questions, but at the same time as I don't want everybody sitting here and being like, God, oh, what, what's going on? Because we ain't got 110 slides to go over like we normally do, so that's that's beneficial, I think. Um, I know I'm having to go back and look. Uh, this is for everybody. Y'all saw the message that Rob put out on the Facebook page about delaying the uh, the test that was coming up. Uh, did y'all see that? Yes. Okay. So we decided to do that at the last night. We were all sitting around talking. Uh, I talked. I went met with Rob and Justin, the guy that was on there the first night that I came on. So we could all get on the same page, and we just felt that it was a better idea to talk to you guys and allow you guys to have some extra time because if we started a new chapter tonight. I just don't think that that's that's fair that y'all had to learn a new chapter plus take a uh, module test. So that's the reason why I would rather review you guys and go over the, the different things of uh, patient assessment, airway, and pharmacology. So that's really all we're doing is we're discussing these case studies. So literally, you guys, probably next 45 minutes, 50 minutes, we are uh, going to be like, holla. So... That's, that's more so y'all understand what we're doing tonight. All right. So let's hit this one of pharmacology. You're, you and your EMT partner are dispatched to a local golf course for a patient complaining of chest pain. Upon arriving, you find a 62-year-old male clutching his chest while seated. Uh, he is conscious, alert, and oriented. So just by what you see right there, somebody build an impression for me. What do y'all see? What do y'all not see? But what are you thinking? Heart attack. So pre or post the uh, golf game, he could have uh, done a little bit more, too much walking. Could have drank a little too much. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I think drinking and golfing goes hand in hand. But um, depends on his age. Is 62 years old. What, it doesn't tell us anything about the temperature outside. Um, could be like, hey, look right there in the chat, y'all. It's pulled a muscle that is, that's possible. Could be, man, he could have been losing by one stroke on the ninth uh, on the ninth hole, and he stroked it. Well, he pulled a muscle. Now he's having chest pains because it could be a referred pain. Um, so that's awesome. Uh, he is showing moderate respiratory distress and states that he has a crushing pain to the center of his chest. So he's, point, he's able to point. So in your patient assessment, hey, man, show me where it's hurting. And he's like, oh, it's right here. So the pain feels different than any previous episode. So he, sir, you said you had an episode? Like, what do you mean? You've had, you've had the same pain in the past? Well, yeah, okay. Have you ever had a heart attack before? So you see that we automatically just started out on to our patient assessment because of what he just said. He has an oxygen saturation of 90%. So we know he's breathing good. He's talking and he's conscious. So your ABCs are marked. Our APU is good and our LOC is good. So those things have been checked off and we really didn't have to say a whole lot. As your partner applies oxygen via nasal cannula, you continue to ask your, pa your patient questions. Uh, why would you oxygenate? Why would you put oxygen on this patient? Why would that be appropriate? Is O2 stats... Uh indicate that so those are 90 yep so he's not hypo but he's borderline um so that's there so i'm gonna catch up also while anybody else is asking if we want to do that so he could be having a heart attack uh possible stroke uh you look for the signs of a stroke if you have any um basically the sludge of the stroke so know those signs um it helps with chest pain and calming the patient because you're giving them more oxygen and they're able to relax and not have to struggle to breathe. 
even though he's at 90, he feels like he's dying. Uh, if he's having chest pain, that's part of the 90% of the protocols that I've seen out there across the world has chest pains is uh, morphine O2 uh, monitor, 12 lead. So those things like that, trying to get away from morphine, going some other methods, but that's kind of the baseline. So what is our next step? What are we going to tell him or what are we going to do next? Hook you up to the monitor. Or get the monitor ready. Uh, if your agency allows uh, EMT basis to put them on a monitor, that's a, just a tool. If they don't, bro, I'm not going to sit around much longer. Well, this dude has already told me that he's, oh, where'd it go? That, come on, back. That it feels different than the previous episodes. That right there is already telling me that he's had a history of chest pains. Something has happened in the past where he's a cardiac he said cardiac related symptoms. Uh, set up the monitors and take him to the emergency room. I'm not going to sit around and play on scene. I'm going to get in the truck and we're going to go. I'm not going to say we're going to haul butt, but we're going to get going because I want that hospital to get closer and not for us to get further away from it. All right. So we're going to go. During our history taken, you note that the onset of the pain was 10 minutes prior to your arrived. The pain got worse when he was walking to the back of the golf cart. And it's not gotten any better since he's been seated. The crushing pain is centered below the sternum, but there's also a slight discomfort to the left shoulder. On a scale of 1 to 10, the pain could be 9. Now, you could be asking, be like, did he lose the golf game and he don't want to pay? And that's why he came up with the pains? No, I'm just picking. So, right there, we're telling you that he's having left shoulder pain, and he's a scale, and he's a 9 out of 10. Now, I like to give, I'm sorry, what are you doing, Tom? So I like to give them, sorry, a zero or a scale of one is something very minor. Like you clicked your fingernails. A 10 is you got hit by a dump truck. And let them give you, because numbers for some people are, are rough. Uh, my numbering system may be different than yours. Your pain scale may be different. I need to know where you rank into those systems. Uh, Victoria's saying priority one to the hospital and notify the ER so they can notify heart cath to be standing on by for heart attack. Um, I'm not going to argue. I for think us, that's a good idea. Go ahead. For us, if there's a, well, I guess the paramedic suspects a STEMI, then we have to call for uh, Samaritan or med flight. Mm -hmm. So. You got to get that prepared. Okay. So, see, so y'all already know what your agencies are requiring, or you sh potential agencies. So, that's helping you build your plan of action. So, you've got it back here, and you know, okay, if I get to this next step and nothing changes, I got to call for air transport. I got to reach out to med consult. So, stuff like that, you're already knowing in the back of your head because you've been in your area for a while. So the patient states that he was diagnosed with angina three years ago. This is the first time since uh, more than eight months that he has experienced any chest pain. He has no allergies and takes nitroglycerin when it's neat when needed. I'm gonna circle this right here. So look, and he takes nitro when needed. So his last oral intake was a uh, tuna sandwich about an hour ago. He's been playing golf for about 45 minutes. So we know what our sample is right there. Y'all remember what the Acronym for sample? Yes. Okay. So we're starting to mark those off. Um, look, Mickey, you already pointed out, asking if the patient's ever had nitro. Well, I apologize if I missed that when I was reading over this, but now he's already said he's he's been diagnosed with the same symptoms as before but he hadn't had any in eight months. Now he does have nitro, or does he have his nitro on him? Does he have his nitro? Because you can potentially give it, depends on what service you were with, but if he has his, let's give it. Uh, and she points out, yep. has he taken it today? Like prior to arrival, when's the last time he took that nitro, or has he taken any of it today? Good point, Victoria. That was a very good point to point out. Um, number three, how does the information revealed in this history assessment and appropriate managing your patient? 
So with what he said in the past eight months, that he hasn't had any episodes, but he does have a history of angina, are we going to do anything differently? Hold on. Let's see. Uh, also ask if he's taking any erectile function disease. Yep, because if we give nitro to that, and then I'm going to tell you, it's what's going to happen is you're going to have two young girls on a truck, and they go and ask these questions, and that dude's going to be like, well, why you ask that? Just because it's everybody knows that's a uncomfortable question. It's like asking, having two guys on a truck and asking a girl, when was the last time your menstrual cycle was? Everybody looks at you like, what? I just want to make sure if you're not pregnant. So you'll see what I'm saying. So think about that when you get ready to ask those questions. Sometimes they can be uh, uncomfortable questions that you need to know. But she asked that particularly because of the the nitro. nitro. What did, uh, come on, Robin. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, you can go ahead. You're fine. No, I mean, if you point out something, I'd love to hear it. It helps us out. No, I was actually uh, talking about the nitro, but that was fine. All right, thank you for keying in. All right, so what additional information is needed to move forward with this patient's care? What are we, is there anything else we want to ask of him, bystanders, or anybody before we push forward? Is there anything? allergies all right so let's click so he said right here that he doesn't has no allergies um so he does take nitro but he so he's eaten 45 minutes ago so what i me being me what i'm gonna ask you had any alcohol today yes or no when's the last time you had anything to drink and what was it um I know his, his age and all that, but you can say any any recreational drugs. I like to joke about that because a lot of people, you know, sometimes take offense to that and be like, nah, bro, I was just asking if you got any on you. I don't really care. I just don't want to roll into the hospital with it and, you know, catch a charge. So you kind of kind of find that fine line to joke with them versus getting your answer out there. Um, so and then they may tell you things different once you get in the back of the truck, because remember, they don't want to get embarrassed. Um, so I think we're pretty good on there, um, asking questions. So here we go right here. It says, as your partner obtains the patient's vitals, you continue to obtain additional information from your patient. Your patient hands, uh, your patient hands you a small sliver pill, silver pill box containing what he claims is his nitro. So what does nitro come in? First off, we'll stop right there. Tell me what nitro comes in. Don't be comes in a very small, dark brown bottle. Okay, check. What did somebody else say? I heard Victoria. Mac, you got anything? It also comes in a paste and a spray. Okay, so think about those. So if he's handing you a small silver pill box, if unless because nitro is a light sensitive medication so that being the case that's why they give you the brown pill bottle and they're little bitty i mean they're they're little so if it's in a silver case it could be mixed with other drugs he could have taken the wrong medication um and just just know if you go to open it and you slide it open or pop it open and there's any type of dust from this medication you done smelt it. Now it's yours to get that, that headache. So if you get a headache from it because you're like, oh, what's in here? You bet you won't do that again. So that should just tell you right there that that's not the right pill bottle. So you find no prescription or patient information on the container. He states that he took one pill as soon as the chest pain began, but no relief. So I'm going to automatically question is it the right medication is for the right person at the right time? Now, if it is old, we can't tell because it's in a, it's in a little silver pill box. So that's a problem. Um, sometimes your small silver, uh, sometimes your small nitro bottles aren't going to have the dates on there either. You can just tell by the powdery substance in the bottle. 
So if you take it and pour it in your hand, I highly to do this. And if there's a lot of powder in the bottom of it, the medication's probably old. They probably had it for a while. There's no sense in getting it refilled if it's still in there. It's not the case there, Holmes. Obviously, something's not working. So your vital signs show a pulse of 124. Uh, they're regular, regular respirations of 18 a minute. Blood pressure, 31, 36 over 80. And it's clear, equal breath sounds. His pupils are equal, round, and reactive to light. Does it sound like there's any problems right there to y'all? Uh, I don't see anything initially, so let's keep going. So, of what significance is the blood pressure of 136 over 80 to use of the nitro? With that blood pressure, are we going to give nitro or no? No, because the stomach is high. Okay. So, that's correct. I'm going to give you both that. It's a borderline high, but it's not that high. So what's nitro going to do to the heart or to the blood pressure? It's going to make it go Maybe. lower. Yeah. It's going to drop. It's going to drop it. Okay. So the heart rate. Anyone so, nitro? So here's this. Y'all are all correct. So let me ask you this. If his blood pressure was 110 over 70, what y'all going to do then? Are you going to give it to him or are you going to withhold it? Do not give withhold it. Withhold it. Y'all are reading or paying attention. I'm proud for y'all. So we don't want to do that because we know <laughs> that the nitro is going to drop it. So with an additional dose of nitro be appropriate in this situation. I don't know if he took it in the first place. So I don't want to give him another one with no. blood pressure to drop it any lower. Because I would just wait. I mean, because I don't know what's in this pill bottle no way. And then it's going to be like, well, he ain't had no bread, he ain't no healed up on him, so we're going to keep trucking and see what's next. Because um, he just looks stable with what I've just read for blood pressures and vital signs, period. So you're unable to identify, uh, to verify the needed information about the nitro to administer an additional dose. We're all agreeing on that. You call for an ALS backup and you don't carry nitroglycerin, you don't carry nitroglycerin or aspirin. While the ALS unit is en route, uh, you prepare your patient for transport. You ensure that the, that he continues to receive high flow O2 and is positioned of comfort. You reassess his vitals every three to five minutes. Victoria says, if you give him more, you risk working a cardiac arrest. If his pressure is 110, correct. Uh, man, y'all own it. Every one of y'all are on that tonight. I'm very proud of y'all. All right, so what information is necessary to administer any additional dose of nitro? With what we've seen so far, what do you information do you need to give him an additional dose of nitro? I don't see any information needed to give him any because I wouldn't give him any more nitro. So there's no IV in him, so you don't have a way to increase the, the pressure. You don't have any way of putting anything in there to him. You don't have uh, an ALS monitor to see what his heart rate's doing. You don't have a four lead or 12 lead. And you, by law, can't do that because that's an invasive re uh, measure. So that being stated is, I ain't going to give it to him. Like y'all just said, he's, sorry, bro. We just going to wait a little bit. But I'm going to do some other things to give him the comfort of we're doing everything in the best of our powers at the time to take care of this guy. We're not gonna look like we're doing this. Like, like I say, we're just gonna wait. Personal, that'll be this week until he hey. get there. Okay, so tell, so tell me why we would do that. Anything burn or some scars on the You talking to me, Chris? Yeah, come on, bro. You give some good information. Tell us what you're doing now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -oh. So, yeah. So tell me what you're talking about. If you saying you're going to elevate his feet with that blood pressure because he's having a, a chest pain, why would you do that? That right there will increase his blood pressure up a little bit. Good job. Until Good paramedics job. get there. 
Okay, all I can do is hit the next button because y'all y'all on top of this tonight. So look, man, we flew in through this faster than we were expected. But see, I ain't got to sit here and preach about it because y'all got it. Y'all understand it. So right there, Victoria said that's a Trendelenburg position. Uh, I'm glad she spelled it because I couldn't have spelled it. I had to Google that real quick. All right, so when you're administering or assisting in the administration of a medication, it is imperative that you follow the certain steps. You got to get med control approval to give it, depending upon your location, I mean, your protocols. Verify that you're giving the proper medication prescription. So we didn't give it because we don't know if that was his. We don't know if he took the nitro, a real nitro. So we all made the decision to withhold his medication. 100% agree with you. 100% have no issues in saying, nope, that's wrong. Nope. Y'all made the best call for the decision. So you verify the form, dose, and route of the medication. Like we talked the other night when I went depth of pharmacology of the pills, the paste, and all that. We want to make sure what we were given, how we're giving it, when we're giving it, and who we're giving it to. So those are big things. So check the expiration date and the condition of the medication. Well, we can't check it because it's in some silver little pill box that he probably bought at, at uh, CVS because it looked better. And more descriptive and uh, more, you know, he can not let everybody know he's taking nitro. So that's, we can't check anything. So you reassess the vitals, especially the heart rate and the blood pressure every three to five minutes, because he's a serious patient. Even though he's not a trauma patient or a critical patient or non-critical, he's critical because that heart rate it can change quickly when it comes to uh, chest pains. I mean, he could drop pretty fast. If the blood pressure was to go down any further. We all going to be going, oh, God, where's that truck? Where's that truck? Because we don't want them no more. Let's get them off our hands, okay? So three to five minutes is perfect. Reassess them there. Look, let me change back to this. So y'all can see me now, and I can see myself, and that's a bad sight, so I'm sorry to hurt y'all's feelings. Y'all tell me what else we need to go over. We've only been here two hours. Um... I think y'all have got a very good understanding of what's going on versus ty typing it in the chat, um, coming on and speaking about it. I think you've done a really good job. I'm glad. I hope y'all get it. I know that I hey, joke Chris. around and laugh sometimes. Come on, do this. What's up? Chris, I got one question. <clears throat> uh, on. If you're an EMT basic, uh, I just want to know, do... If the hospital calls say well, they got a patient that's on 15 liters of O2, non-rebreathing, mm -hmm. is that considered a ALS or a BLS? Well, you have the ability to put some money on 15 liters non-rebreather, don't you? You can transport yeah. them from any facility on that as long as they don't have anything hanging from them. They're not a critical patient. So that being said, is you, you can transport that. Um, now, it's also at the same time as if for some odd reason you don't feel comfortable in transporting that patient, call your supervisor. Be like, hey, uh, cause let me holla at you. I, this is what the hospital is telling me. The patient don't look like what the hospital is telling me. So you, you feel free to call your supervisor, your field suit, whomever, and just be like, can we rethink this uh, transport? Because I'm not real sure about transporting that patient. Um. So to answer your question, I hope that got you is that, yes, you can transport that as a, as a basic on a basic truck. Um, you probably get stuck doing all if you're on a basic truck, you'll be doing some hospital to home transports, uh, hospital to hospital, some dialysis and stuff like that that may require those services. OK. Uh, I was just wonder. Yeah. Um, so does anybody have. We've got our, I got the other presentations pulled up. If there's anything that y'all want to talk about real quick, uh, maybe go over if it's something you didn't understand, that's fine. Like I've told y'all before, please shoot me a message uh, in that Facebook group that Rob's created. I'll help you out. Um, now that I'm at home, I'm only home for a couple of days. Um, I kind of spend a lot of times in the afternoons, the evenings with the family. So if you shoot a message to me before you take your test or even after your test, if you have a question, Give me some time to get back to it. And it's not that I'm ignoring you guys. I'm just home for just a few short days before I go back out for 14 days. Um, 
anybody in the group, there's a 17 of y'all. Do y'all have anything y'all want to discuss? Go over me to readdress anything like that. The only thing I was going to add to that, Chris, um, about the transport. The only way I've ever seen um, somebody be able to transport with IVs and stuff on a basic unit is if the nurse actually rode with them. Um, okay. And that's the only way I've ever seen that be able done because technically, and it's then this is most places, a basic cannot transport with an IV still in an arm. No, because that's that's right. Uh, that's a uh, an advanced procedure. Um, technically, you're not even supposed. To, I mean, we know what happens in the back of the truck stays in the back of the truck, but by law, um, nobody's supposed to do that besides a paramedic or an ALS provider, uh, paramedic and hire. So, if anything's hanging, or even if you have it capped off, you can't you can't touch that. So make sure you know what you can and can't transport. Um, that's a good one, Chase. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I personally feel like y'all have got a decent grasp of this. Um, I know some have said some things, some haven't said some things, and that's cool. Um, I'm fine with that, but I've seen your grades. Uh, Rob actually pulled them up for me and looked at some of the grades. Uh, y'all are doing really good. Uh, I know I've only been teaching three nights that y'all have really taken tests on, so I hope that I've done something good for y'all and your grades have been, are, are doing well. Um, if there's something that I need to try to change for you guys for on this next module, let me know. Um, I'm not perfect. I think I mean I think I am, but I've been told otherwise. So y'all let me know. I will try to adjust it. I will try to work something out and we'll go from there. Um, anybody have any other questions, concerns? Y'all want to talk about something before we cut out tonight? And I'm trying to get to Rob's message so I can tell him to chat the code too. Let me get back to the chat real quick. Nope, JW says, let's get out of here. Um, all right, I am going to put your code in here and I'm gonna let y'all have a good night. I'm gonna send y'all out of here. Your code is AMJ Alpha Mary John 443. I'm sorry, I'm trying to listen to my wife to fuss at my daughter. So there's your code is AMJ443. Guys, if y'all need anything, please reach out to me. Um, good luck on your module test. Um, I hope everything works out for y'all. I hope you do your best scores. I hope this session uh, helped y'all out some. If not, and let me know. Our Tuesday. I'm sorry? The test is due Monday or Tuesday. Monday. 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 Maybe I can't lie to you. I don't know. I, I, okay. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know how that is. Um, let me ask Rob. He just takes me around. Where's Mondo 2? Good night. He put on Facebook group that it was due midnight between February 8th and 9th. Okay. So he says it's due Monday night. He was about to log on, so I don't know if we saved ourselves yeah. or not, but he uh, actually he texted me. He's like, oh, I was about to log on right now. Um. I hope uh, y'all do good on your test. Uh, we will start back again Tuesday night. Um, I'll be back at work. Uh, so y'all should all be ready to start module three um, Tuesday night. Other than that, good luck on your modules. Uh, y'all have a good weekend. Um, don't do too much for the party for the Super Bowl because we know that's coming up this weekend. But y'all be safe. Good luck. I got to work. Yeah. Uh, I don't, so I don't really care, man. So I'm gonna I'm watch it for you. <laughs> All right. I'm not playing. I'm not caring either. Oh, you working? <laughs> Listen, y'all yeah, say I'd be at work. Hey, guys. Charles and right, Natalia. Charleston. Oh, man. Yeah, I got to beat out.
Friday, Saturday, and I go to Carsdale Monday. I might catch you in the rain in Thailand. <laughs>